84 caribou. That's all we could find. And we searched and searched this country, on foot and in helicopter, by canoe and on snowshoe. 84 caribou, all that was left of the Avalon herd. Yes, back in the late 1950s, we wildlife men had pretty well given up hope for the survival of these animals. Their range here on the Avalon Peninsula in the easternmost part of Newfoundland was simply too small, too crowded. Illegal hunting had taken its toll. There was hydro development, there were roads pushing inland, and people, most of all, there were people. Our population was increasing rapidly. St. John's had grown into a bustling port of 100,000. It was only 30 miles away from the northern edge of the Caribou Range. Life was changing rapidly here in Newfoundland. We were more affluent, more mobile. We had leisure time now, and the primitive backcountry, the wild interior of the Avalon, became more and more attractive. Closer and closer, men edged to the heart of the Avalon wilderness. Closer and closer to the home of the caribou. They found it barren, rocky, windswept, yet with a primitive beauty all its own. Huge boulders lay scattered about, massive monuments to the great glaciers that once inched their way over the Avalon scraping away the soil, leaving the hilltops bare and raw. A crazy quilt of bog and barren and scrub forest, laced with ponds and lakes and rivers. A subarctic wilderness in the heart of the Avalon. But this land was bare and barren only to the casual observer, for those who looked closely found a rich and varied carpet beneath their feet. It was this carpet which sustained the caribou. In summer, the tender green shoots. In winter, the clusters of white lichens, the caribou moss. And so this country, wild, windy, raw, barren, was a home, a retreat, for a tiny band of caribou, struggling now for survival. The Avalon caribou, less than a hundred animals now, a tiny remnant of the herd that once roamed this peninsula. One trigger happy hunter could wipe them out. Well, just when most of us had given the herd up as a lost cause, just when we figured the Avalon herd would have to be sacrificed to progress, a man called Mike Nolan appeared on the scene. Well, actually, he was always there, for Mike was a trapper. All winter, he'd hunt fox and otter and beaver here in the center of the peninsula. He was one of the rare breed of Newfoundlanders who made their living from the land instead of the sea. And so, one day, Mike Nolan Trapper became Mike Nolan Wildlife Officer. That was 25 years ago.
Mike's job to protect the Avalon caribou, to help them survive. A hopeless, helpless task, a lonely, impossible job. One man in this wild country, charged with saving a rapidly dwindling herd of caribou. Well, you walk, uh, perhaps all day you walk, and you may see the track of a caribou, and you may not, eh? you may one track, so the few that were around, uh, there weren't that many, less, less than 100 animals all over that country, so it didn't show up very much. I spent in a week, five and six, seven, eight days. The, long, the longest stretch was 22 days. I spent 22 days that one stretch of that coming at one time. Sometimes you'd, uh, you'd have it pretty rough, you know, because uh, you'd leave in the storms and that come on. I used to use uh, skis. I used skis and snowshoes and uh, when I'd be at that. Skis were very good, you know. Uh, you'd cover a lot of ground. Uh, and I always travel alone. I never, hardly, very seldom I had anybody with me. Certain times of the year, of course, they have a different range. Uh, you take, uh, in the summertime, of course, they probably use mostly the bogs, eh, and perhaps near the the wooded areas, eh? But when you take, uh, come fall of the year, and especially heavy snows, of course, they take to the higher ground where they can get uh, the food more easily. Eh? They get down uh, where the snow have uh, drifted down thin, and then, of course, they'll, uh, they'll paw down. You go to some places during the winter time after it freeze up, and you'll see where they had dug it up in, you know, like, uh, where they'd paw down uh, some moss among it and some berries among it, eh, and stuff like that. Winter, spring, summer, fall. Mike would be on the barrens, studying the caribou, protecting them. But it wasn't just this herd that needed protection. Caribou herds in other parts of Newfoundland had dwindled too. In fact, on the whole island, there were less than 5,000 animals. Years of uncontrolled hunting had taken its toll. But the caribou here had another predator. The lynx was killing a great many of our caribou. Leaving its normal forest habitat in late May and early June, it would attack the caribou fawns that had just been born on the barrens. The young caribou are small at birth, weighing only 14 or 15 pounds. Easy prey for the stealthy lynx lurking at the edge of the forest. Rarely would the fawns be eaten by the lynx, for the mother doe would quickly rush to the rescue and drive off the attacker. But the damage had been done. Bacterial infection would set in. We found young caribou lying dead and dying all over the barrens. It was time for Mike Nolan to put his old trapping skills to use. Lynx were removed from around the calving grounds. But lynx trapping alone would not save the caribou. Mike patrolled the country on foot, visiting the hunters in their homes and camps, talking with them about the caribou, persuading them to leave the animals alone. Those he couldn't persuade, he discouraged. He hinted of helicopter patrols. There'd be notes to other wardens casually left in the country. Not many knew that Mike was really alone, for his tracks were everywhere.
You got to, to get stay with them. You got to go into places where the animals frequent and find out the uh, different times of the year where they're at. And of course, you got to, to go in there and make a scatter trip out to the settlements from time to time, talk to the people, stay all night, and go back among the caribou again. And uh, of course, uh, everyone know you're in there, and that's your purpose. So a uh, few fellas that wouldn't normally go in will probably forget the whole thing. Well, gradually, the herds started to rebuild. The caribou were starting to come back. Each year, there were more and more animals in the herd. You'd see them in places they'd never been seen in living memory. People not accustomed to caribou came home with stories of strange white moose. New trails crisscrossed the barrens. Old trails were deeper, wider. Everywhere the caribou seemed to be increasing, but nowhere was the change more dramatic than here on the Avalon. For here the task had seemed impossible. There were too many roads, there were too many people, there was too much pressure. Yet the caribou were increasing, even here. Mike was now involved in wildlife management as much as he was in law enforcement. In the early days, he had to go on foot or in canoe or by ski and snowshoe. Now he found himself taking more and more to the air. An hour or two in helicopter can sometimes give you as much information about the caribou as a week or more of field work on the ground. Getting the herd composition, checking on the animals, law enforcement. The helicopter was a new tool in an old game. Every now and then, I'd make a trip with Mike, just to keep in touch with him and with the Avalon wilderness. But mostly, Mike and I went in just to watch our favorite animal, the caribou. Sometimes we found them to be nearly tame. There were moments I'll never forget. Over the years, one of Mike's main worries was the growing number of snow toboggans and all-terrain vehicles. It was so easy for these machines to push into the caribou country. Even if people did not shoot the animals, they would disturb and scatter them. Wilderness legislation was passed. It prohibited the use of these machines on the caribou ground. It was a happy day for Mike when he put up the signs. Cabins were also banned. Mike burned down some. Others fell to his power saw. By 1972, the herd had reached a thousand animals. The tide had turned. The Avalon herd was no longer in danger. In fact, the Avalon herd was one of the healthiest in the province. Some of the stags were huge, dwarfing those of other herds. There were enough animals now for a limited amount of hunting to provide meat and sport. 
and trophies, world record antlers were recorded. Hunting was controlled, though, the herd allowed to grow. Soon there were so many caribou on the Avalon that some could be captured and transferred to other places, to isolated islands and places where caribou had been hunted out years ago. The Avalon herd, the herd that had been on the verge of extinction a few years before, would now colonize other parts of the island. Well, herding is a Western tradition. But we Newfoundlanders figured we'd give it a try too. But we'd do it our own way. And so began a new kind of roundup. We try to drive them out in the lake. And then when you get them out in the lake, of course, you pick uh, the, the ones you, you're going to take first the earring or the, the calf that was born that say they were born in, in June and you would be at transferring them perhaps in, in fall, late fall. Pick out the cast, a male or female, and perhaps you'd they land uh, a float equipped helicopter, and of course they'd be the guy get out on the float and they'd uh, they'd lasso the calf. And of course when the the animal get on bottom, of course you had to be prepared to leave the float too, <laughs> where it could be a first to your neck, and uh, and then you'd go up and wrestle the animal down time off. to the ground, uh, of course, they're tied up, and uh, we put them in a, a net, and uh, we, the helicopter take them and, and take them back to the central country and, and release them in the place we have picked to start the herd. We're not after using the drug. If we did, we'd probably be a little more careful than that, but uh, the animal is still in, uh, in good shape. He's only tied uh, just so he can't get his feet clear, that's all. After making several releases now, you know, different places, uh, but this one, late, last one, now has been on the Cape Show. Of course, they had caribou out there years ago, and uh, uh, they seem to say that, uh, you know, they probably hunted the last one down, and now uh, the people uh, wanted another herd started out there. So now we we got it uh, started, and so far, so good, you know. This, uh, I don't think the people touched the manual, so uh, I, I think we're going to make it out there. Now, again, uh, I don't know if we had hard winter since Skidoo's got back in the country, what would happen there? Of course, we're trying to keep uh, radios on these animals, and we're going to be able to keep track of them uh, to see what do happen, because in a case like that, uh, if you drive them off at their winter range, I wonder, would they leave it again, go back where they came from? So this is why we have them uh, radios on them. And so, decorated with tags and ribbons, stamped with numbers and sporting the latest in radio transmitters, these caribou were released on the barrens of the Cape Shore. All they had to do now was survive and reproduce. The survival of this tiny herd would depend on many things, their own health and vitality, on food and weather, on predators, but more than anything else, it would depend on the attitude of the people in the communities nearby. Would they protect them? Would they leave the little herd alone? We had a big uh, 
Mike met with community leaders. He spoke to hunters. He visited schools. He talked and talked and talked about the caribou. To do an experiment on them to feed, you know, what kind of feed. And I, I'd get in with the caribou in the, in the morning and stay in a little shack there, and I'd watch them all day. And I used a stopwatch, and I had different types of food. How many seconds are on different types of plants at different times of the year, you know, and all through the winter. We were doing an experiment on them. And we, uh, <clears throat> we put in, a, we'd knock them out and put them in a pan, and we'd feed them uh, just natural, their own food, eh? We'd gather the moss and put it in, and we weigh in the food in the morning, and we weigh it out in the evening to find out how many pounds you consumed. Per this is the generation that will reap the fruits of Mike's work. These are the ones who will see the herd grow. It's their herd now. And even they were kept fed, you know, with their natural food in the winter. There are lots of hunters on the Cape Shore. Lots of people travel inland hunting moose and partridge and rabbits. They've seen the caribou, but they've left them alone. The herd continues to grow. It's still just a small band, but in the years to come, there could be thousands. Why not? For it's already happened with the Avalon herd. At last count, there were 3,400 animals on the Avalon, all descended from that pathetic little herd of 84 animals 25 years ago. Many times I've flown in to see the Avalon herd. Sometimes I've backpacked in. It's not something you do on a Sunday afternoon, for these are wild animals, primitive animals, that have survived hundreds of years of hunting. They're well back in the country. They're wild, hard to find. Well, yes, they were, but not anymore. Not if you're at the right place at the right time. Like I was last year, here on the Southern Avalon. I could scarcely believe my eyes. Here, not two hours drive from St. John's, was a herd of caribou grazing not 200 yards from the road. You could watch them from your car. Or if you were careful and quiet, you could walk among them and you didn't have to be a grizzled old woodsman either. I've seen a lot of caribou. I've studied them, I've hunted them, I've photographed them. I've spent a lot of time in the caribou country. But now, to stroll in, to see the Avalon caribou up close, to mingle among the herd, to show them to my son and to my friends, to share their new joy was the biggest thrill of all. Where else in the world can you see scenes like this, so close to towns and cities? St. John's is only 50 miles away. There are dozens of communities even closer. There's a road nearby. Once they were nearly gone, you know, the Avalon herd was nearly extinct. 25 years ago, I wouldn't have bet a dollar on their chances of survival. Now look at them. When I think of the Avalon herd, I think of Mike Nolan. 
oh, I know he's not the only one who's worked to preserve and protect these animals. There have been many, and they're still out there. But Mike, well, Mike is the one who traveled this country alone, back in the days when the going was tough, when there was only a pathetic, tattered remnant of a caribou herd here on the Avalon. He knew this country, he was a part of it, and he knew the caribou. He knew they could survive. And that's what he fought for all those years. Mike is 65 now. He's retiring from his job, but not from the Avalon wilderness. For if I know Mike, he'll be traveling in as long as he's able to walk over the string of bogs that lead inland to the caribou country, to the country that holds so many memories, to the animals that have meant so much to him. And when he can't walk in anymore, Mike says he's going to build a tower here in this field by his home so he can sit and watch over the Avalon herd.